sounded like you already song. It's a great song. That's us laying our hearts down before God. Let's just continue to worship and stand on behalf of the one who stood for us.
Can we say those words and really mean it? Jonathan's going to really challenge that today. For us to say and believe all I am, all I am is yours. Can we really surrender it all? Take our hearts on that journey today, God, and answer that question in each of our hearts. Are we willing to lay down our hearts for the sake of the call of Jesus Christ himself? And now, church, we say together, a prayer that could be taken lightly, but there's such power in this prayer. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together as we continue our journey of worship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beautiful prayer, church. Thank you. We're going to allow you now to stay in this mindset and heart set of prayer. And there are cards uh, for you to write on that are along the front of the platform, tables around the, the room. We'd like just for you to take this next song to express your heart. You can be seated. Whether it's joy or, or burdened, just truthfully express your heart to God. And at the end of the service, we'll read one of these prayers, but we get hundreds of prayers each week, and they're not taken lightly. They're prayed over all week long. So we've selected a few of the prayers from last week, and while we're singing this next song of worship and you're offering your personal prayer to God, we're going to read some of your prayers from last week. Here's our heart, God. Father, I ask you for peace in my life. I'm anxious about the upcoming months, and only your perfect peace can keep me grounded. Let me find all my worth in you and you alone. I love you. Another prayer. Please pray for healing of my broken heart. Please give me strength and peace and help me think only about good things and not listen to lies from the evil one. Please pray for healing. Rescue me from this terrible storm. Thank you for hearing the prayers of your people. Houston, Rockport, Corpus Christi, Florida, Texas. Dear Lord, help me, help us all to use your eyes to see the needs of those around us and reach out to them. We're made aware of the needs in war-torn countries, areas of natural disasters, illness, and divorce. So Lord, give us hearts and resources to help. But there are many around us, many educated, middle class, and wealthy who need you just as much. But their pain and sorrow is less obvious. It's hidden. It's ignored. We need the Lord's rescue in different ways. Help us and help me to see beyond the forced smiles and the ways we say things are great in our responses so we can be your servants to
but I've just recently become aware of the depth of my brokenness in this relationship. I've been prideful regarding my friend, and that has led me to a lack of hospitality and love toward him. I need to make amends, but I also confess my sin of pride to God. I feel so unworthy, a new feeling at this extreme. Please pray that God's love will flood me to the depths of my heart. That feelings of being anxious, outcast, not good enough will dissolve into princess, child of God, and loved. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they're forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective.
we offer ourselves up to you. I don't think we quite know what that means, God. So this morning, we put our sacrifice in front of you, Jesus. Not because we have to, not because it's something that we're compelled to do, but God, because it's something that drives us from deep inside of us because we know that you have first loved us. So our sacrifice, God, comes from love. We offer ourselves because we trust that your way is so much better than our way. So God, as we offer ourselves and our money and our time and our hearts, God, we know that you can turn all things into good. So we offer it willingly, Jesus. We say, here is my heart. Here is my life. Speak what is true and do what you always do, which is so, so good. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be in your presence this morning and every morning and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe that the healing is done best in community, actually, you know, with, um, with our family members, with our friends, uh, with our church community. But at times, we, we can get in those stuck places, and we actually need somebody that has, has some tools that our friends and our family don't have, <laughs> or that aren't from inside the same circle. And so um, I see it as a ministry because having those tools and then also being a follower of Jesus, and I believe all healing comes from Jesus, I think just integrates all things, uh, mind, body, and spirit. I have the, the great honor of walking alongside um, graduate students that are in uh, MFT programs or psychology programs um, and having them here working in the counseling center. I think the biggest reason why I wanted to be an intern here at the Highland Counseling Center was because I wanted to learn how to effectively integrate my faith while still being able to be a good effective therapist. The internship at Highland Counseling Center has enabled me to build a therapeutic relationship with people from all different walks of life. That's how Highland Counseling Center is. We meet people right where they are. So if you're finding yourself in one of those um, spots where you're just you're stuck and you need someone to come alongside you and help um, perhaps offer tools offer a listening ear offer compassion and acceptance um, please contact us um, we have several different counselors that are available uh, different levels of, of training different ages different ethnicities and we'd love to walk alongside you in this time you can contact us at 325 201-3030 or by emailing at counselingcenter at highlandchurch.org. We're so grateful for the work of Gretchen and all those at the Highland Counseling Center for the way that God is bringing about restoration through their work. Uh, my name is Darren Reese and I'm the Director of Global Ministries here at Highland. I have a couple announcements for you uh, regarding our global ministries. First of all, we have a new podcast, uh, the Restoration Podcast. This is another opportunity for you to learn about our Restore the World vision and to hear from voices around the globe about what God is doing to bring about restoration. So each week there will be a new episode and you'll hear interviews with people from Brazil and Myanmar, Lebanon, and other places as well. And also some members from Highland who have been a part of Restore the World. So be sure to check that out. You can look on our website on the media page and subscribe to it. It's also searchable on iTunes, so please check that out. Also next week, uh, September 24th at 4 o'clock, in room 112, we're going to have an interest meeting for short-term mission trips for 2018 trips to Brazil and Southeast Asia. So come and hear about those opportunities, how you might get involved, and also hear about our new strategy for short-term trips here at Highland. We're glad you're here this morning. If 
your kids are going to go to his kids' worship, you can dismiss them now out this direction. And while they go, please stand up, look for somebody you may not know, and greet them with the peace of Christ. surrounded by dozens, maybe hundreds of other temples. But this is the ruins of the temple of the main god in the ancient world, Zeus. Zeus is known by almost everybody. When you think of Zeus, you picture an old man in the sky who has lightning bolt and doesn't wear that many clothes and, and maybe gets angry easily. Um, but in the day that Zeus was worshipped, everybody worshipped Zeus because they worshipped power. Zeus sounds like this ancient primitive religion, that something that silly people used to believe in. But the truth is, I see a little Zeus worship in everybody, including myself. At home, at work, around my friends, when I try to one-up somebody, in the way I think of politics, the way I think of how important politics are, the way I try to pursue power in my own life, in my own career. Zeus sounds like this ancient religion, but the truth is we bend our knee to Zeus more than we know. So a couple of days ago, our oldest two kids, Eden and Samuel, nine and seven, I overheard them in an argument where Eden said to Samuel, uh, Zeus is not real, stop saying that he is. And I you know, kind of piqued my interest, so I started listening in more. And he goes, Eden, Zeus is real, and it's a fact. I read it in a book. <laughs> well, what book is that? So ever since we went to, Luke and I, my preacher buddy, went, went to Greece, um, they've been reading about Greece and specifically like Greco-Roman gods and all that stuff. And he showed me a book, and in it there's this picture, if you could put this up. It's a picture of Zeus, and it says fact on there. And so he put those two things together like, huh, I guess this is real after all. And my immediate thought was, sheesh, you let your kid read Harry Potter one time, and this is the kind of stuff that happens. And it's, so I'm bringing back book burnings for that one book because he's... <clears throat> Zeus, when we think of the ancient gods, Zeus is probably the person that comes to mind immediately. He's, you know, the, the god of, the, the ruler of all rulers, the god of all gods in the ancient world. He was the god you went to when you wanted something fixed. One of the more interesting things of being in Athens, when we saw in the Athens Museum, were all these like uh, statues of the Roman emperors. And over time, they started to make the statues of the emperors look more like Zeus. Because they wanted you not just to obey the emperors. They wanted you to worship the emperors. They wanted you to know Zeus had something to do with the emperor being there. And so it was. Christians were killed by the thousands called atheists. Because they did not worship Zeus. Specifically, they did not worship the emperor. It was no small thing. That Paul wrote to Roman Christians in the capital of this global empire. He wrote, I want you to pray for the emperor, not to the emperor. And they were killed because they refused to do exactly that. Stanford, um, Stanford University in the 60s, they did a, a, a survey, a, a significant amount of the population. They asked, who do you most want your kid not to marry? What group of people? And as you can imagine, in America in the 60s, it was somebody of another skin color. Specifically, black or white was the, the main thing. If you were black, you didn't want your kid married white, white, black. But they did that exact survey again recently. And the answers came back totally different. This time, the thing that we don't want our kids to marry, the person we don't want our kids to marry, is someone of a different political persuasion. 
You want to know what idols you worship? Watch where you draw the lines. It turns out, Zeus sounds like this ancient religion, but we worship Zeus all the time. Zeus was not just the god of power. Zeus was also known as the god of justice. He had a a standard of justice, and yeah, it was a low standard, but if you wanted something fixed, Zeus was who you prayed to. So we saw in these Greek museums all these things called cursing tablets, where if you got upset by somebody, somebody threw shade at you or something, you would go and you would write down um, basically a rant against that person and what you wanted the gods to do do to them. And I tell, it's the weirdest thing. When I read those in the museums, you want to know what they read like? Facebook posts. They read like angry Facebook rants. They, you know, this person did this and, and the world has offended me. Um, interestingly enough, Nietzsche, the famous atheist, said in post-Christian Europe that in all our claims for justice, that if there is no God, if you don't buy into the Christian or Jewish story about God being on the side of the underdog and the oppressed, then stop acting like that when you talk about justice. Because if there is no God... There is no justice. There, it's a veiled attempt at power. That's all it really is. And look around the world. Can you see where Nietzsche's coming from? I think this critique needs to be taken really seriously. Especially when, we talk, when we're talking about what we're talking about today. Because we don't worship Zeus, or at least we tell ourselves that. But notice our politics. You notice that Democrats and Republicans both talk a lot about justice. But if you're skeptical at all, then some party has got to start saying, but is it because they really care about this stuff? Or is it because they really want to just stay in power or closer to home? Do you ever wonder that the righteous cause that people are leading up, or maybe that you're a part of, isn't so much for the righteous cause, but because you like leading? Because you like people following you? So we're in a series called Christians Make the Best Atheist. And the big idea behind it, I'm not trying to be funny with that title. The big idea behind it is that since 9-11, there's been a dramatic rise of people in America called the nuns who are not affiliated with any religion. They, they don't want to argue with you about religion. They don't want to participate. They just, they're just walking away from it all. And the point of this series is that when we turn away from one thing, We are always turning towards something else. When we turn away from God, we are turning towards something else. When the first Christians were baptized, they would wait till Easter Eve. And at midnight, they would take off all their clothes. They would go to the baptistry. And they would turn and face the west. These pagan temples, temples of Zeus. And they would spit and renounce those gods. And then they would turn and face the east. And they would pledge allegiance to King Jesus. Then they were baptized. And from that moment on, they were known to the rest of the world... As atheists, because they didn't worship those God. And as we are turning away collectively, away from the God of Jesus, we find that we are actually turning back towards the very gods they turned away from. And there's nowhere that that's as true as today. Because we've got some pretty good evidence since 9 11 of collect- social um, evidence of what happens. When we turn away from the God of Jesus. You can see it in our increased fear and anxiety. In our rising hostility towards each other. Our inability to listen. Ironically it's a God as old as time itself. And a God that Christians have always been called to not worship. And in order to see the temptation that this God has in your own life. I want to tell you a story that if you grew up in church. You probably are familiar with. But you might not have paid that much attention to. It's this bizarre and confusing and funny and profound story. When you realize what's going on. If you got your Bibles turn to 1 Samuel. That's where we're going to be chapter 18. It, it's a story of King Saul. Because Israel, the people of God, didn't always have a king. They were originally a theocracy. They were ruled by uh, God's law and prophets that God would speak through. But eventually Israelites said, we want to be like all the other nations. We want to have a king. And so God does the worst thing God can do. God gives them exactly what they want. They have a king. And what a king. When King Saul, when we're first introduced to King Saul, he looks like a king. He's tall, dark, and handsome, as if those things matter. And he's just, you know, you know, he looks like a king. And for the first couple of chapters and couple of pages or years, he's a really good king. 
But after a while, like Adam and Eve before him, Saul misuses his power. And God, through Samuel, comes to Saul and says, I'm going to take away the kingdom from you. You're not going to be king forever. And Saul loses his mind. When he hears he's going to lose his power, it causes him to lose his mind and ultimately his kingdom. Because just a, a, a short time later, God introduces a new character into this story. David. And when we first meet David, he's not a king. He's the opposite of Saul. Saul is tall, tall, dark, and handsome, and David is none of those things. David is a little boy watching the sheep. So much so, he, he looks so much not like a king, that when Samuel comes to, uh, to, to the house that God sends him to, Jesse, David's dad, brings out all his other sons because he doesn't think David has any qualifications to be king. It's the Cinderella story of the Old Testament. He leaves David in the house and eventually he finds out, okay, God's not calling any of them to be king. He brings out David and, and God has to tell Samuel, yes, this is the one. And once David steps onto the pages of the Old Testament, he rises like a meteor. He quickly comes out as this brave kid who'll do things like fight giants or you know, lead men into battle against bigger and stronger armies and come out ahead and ahead, or ahead again and again. But this isn't a sermon about David. Today, I want to keep the focus on what Saul does as he's watching out of the corner of his eye. David, start coming up behind him. Because what Saul does is ultimately something that we're all tempted to do. It's a problem we all face, and it's ultimately a problem of idolatry. So, one of the greatest American theologians that's ever existed is a guy named Reinhold Niebuhr. He's incredibly influential. He was Obama's favorite theologian. Obama quoted him at length. And Niebuhr, back in the 40s and 50s, there was a bunch of theologians who were kind of scratching their heads wondering, after World War II, what happened? How did we get here? And Reinhold Niebuhr looked at the world that happened after you know, the rise of Hitler and all that stuff, and he, he said, when we turn away from God, the thing we are the most tempted to turn towards is power. That's what we want. We're t- we, we turn away from God and, and t- turn towards power. And he said it's because of original sin. He said of all the Christian doctrines, original sin is the most empirically verifiable. That we are all like Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve, it was not enough for them to be like God. They wanted to be God. And here's Niebuhr's great insight. He says the reason that we all are tempted to worship power, to chase after power with our lives, is because we all feel this great sense of cosmic insignificance. Like we all know how vulnerable we are. We all know how exposed and easy to do, how, how vulnerable we are. So about 10 years ago when I lived in Fort Worth, my buddy Bad Brad and I used to go to the gym like you know a couple of times a month. And at the gym, there was this guy who was there, uh, Mr. Muscles. And every gym has a guy like this who, who like yells and screams when he's working out, you know, while he's trying to get up that extra. He's a guy you like walk around it to avoid. Um, anyway, so we're in the locker room one day, and I take my gym bag out of, the lock, out of my locker and I set it on the bench right next to me. And I accidentally, I didn't know his bag was there. Mr. Muscle's bag was there. And I knocked his bag off with my gym bag. And then I was, you know, up there just not paying any attention. And Mr. Muscles, who's like six foot seven, has muscles on top of muscles, comes over and hovers over me and bad Brad. Like he could sell shade for a living. So we are now in his shade. And the first thing Mr. Muscle says to us is, uh, do we have a problem? I like his voice that I have him doing. Do we have a problem? And we're like looking up like, uh, why would we possibly want a problem with you, sir? And he goes, well, my bag. And we were like, we realized he thinks I did this on purpose. And Bad Brad's just watching me like, you know, drag him down with him. And so we're like, no, no, we're, we, uh, look at, we're not going to pick on you. You're, you're a giant. You're a big guy. And he goes, some people like to pick on the big ones. And I was, we can assure you, sir, we are not those kinds of people. Anyway, at one point, he, he asks us if we need to step outside, like maybe for some kind of post-workout workout for him or something. And we, you know, like, no, no, we, we don't want to step outside. We would like to stay in this very public environment with lights, you know. And, and so, you know, we back down and apologize and all that. And then as we're leaving later in the parking lot, like our male ego kicks in and we're like, 
And you know what we should have said? <laughs> what we should have said is you're just lucky because we're exhausted from our jazzercise exercise. That, <laughs> but that's the only reason we didn't want to step outside. Reinhold Niebuhr says that's the reason you want power. Because we're all, we all have this sense of, of, of how vulnerable we are, how, how we could be destroyed, how small we are. And so we all chase power because we all want to pretend like we're way more in control of our lives than we actually are. Malcolm Gladwell, uh, the, the journalist, wrote a great book a few years ago called Outliers, where he pointed out that 95% of our lives are outside of our control. He looked at a lot of the different success stories and pointed out like people like Bill Gates would never have been Bill Gates if it hadn't been for his access to technology and education from an early age because of a, a certain amount of social things that happened to him. And he goes through the list, but basically the point of the entire book is that we're all the product of genetics, environment, and personal choices. And two out of three of those things you have no control over. I mean, did you get to pick where you were born? Or what century you would be born in? Or what family you would be born in? Or what your genetic makeup would be? Or what your talents, what kind of talents you would have? So for example, you may be a, I, I pulled myself up from my bootstraps kind of person. Great. But if you were born in a yurt in outer Mongolia, you would not have the level of success you have today. And you have no control over that. What you have, almost all of what you have, has been a gift. To come closer to home. Think of your family background. You, you may spend your younger years telling yourself you're nothing. You don't want to be anything like your parents. But somewhere around middle age, you start to realize how profoundly your parents or your family have shaped you. Gladwell's whole point in his book is that we're not personally responsible for our success. At least not nearly as much as we'd like to think we are. Most of the, of the forces that make up who we are are given from the hand of God. This is Paul's point to the Christ, to Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians when they're arguing about, you know, I follow, I follow one Christian leader. I know I like this other Christian leader. Paul actually says this in 1 Corinthians, if you could put that up. Paul says, I want, you to know the me I want you to learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go what is beyond, beyond what is written, because then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. You won't be proud. For what makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you, and this is a great question to ask ourselves, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? You want to know why we do that? Because we have lied to ourselves. We have forgotten that almost everything we have, we have been given. That's why we pursue power. And God forbid, we one day get some of it. So back to King Saul. King Saul is watching young David grow in popularity. And after a while, it begins to grate on him. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting in verse 5, it says, Whatever mission Saul sent David on, he was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. As well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul doesn't like that song. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. When Saul first started out as king, people loved him. He was a champion. He, was, you know, he looked like a king. He was always cheered on by them. But when those voices stopped, he could not handle it. When David starts getting more Twitter followers than him, when, when that song, David's Killed Tens of Thousand, becomes the top hit on iTunes, he can't handle it. And so, Saul has this idea. His daughter, Michael, has a crush on David. She has eyes for David, and he thinks David might be interested in her as well. The problem is David is a poor shepherd. He doesn't have any kind of money to, have a, to pay a bride price, especially for a princess. 
And so Saul goes to David with this sneaky plan, and he says, listen, I know you don't have money for a bridal price, but instead of money, what I will take from you is this. The Philistines were like the Russians or North Koreans. They were the enemies of the Israelites of their day. They were afraid of them. They were constantly at war with them. And um, he said, I want you to go bring me back, go to the Philistines, attack them, and bring me back a hundred Philistine foreskins. You know, just like when you registered at Target. <laughs> and the point is, obviously, the Philistines aren't going to sign up for this, so he's going to have to kill them and, and put himself in danger. And he's thinking, David's going to get killed doing that. But David goes off. And a few weeks later, he comes back, not with 100, but 200. The things we do for love... And when Saul sees this, like everybody's kind of cheering David on. But now Saul is stuck. Because in what he thought was trying to manipulate the situation, he's actually wound up letting this really popular kid marry into the royal family, getting one step closer to the throne. And so Saul, he starts not being able to sleep at night. He keeps dreaming up ways to like humiliate David and shame him. And then after weeks and weeks of stewing on his jealousy and anxiety, Saul decides... The best way is the most direct way. I'm just going to kill David myself. And in chapter 19, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. It says, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. And I'll speak to him about you and I will tell you what I find out. And so Jonathan, who's so wise and brave and really the best named character in the whole Bible, Jonathan <clears throat> tells his dad, Dad, David's not gunning for your job. David's always been incredibly loyal. He's for you. And he talks Saul off the edge of the cliff one more time. And then just a few verses later, there's another war that breaks out. And David is highly successful in leading a campaign against it. And Saul just can't handle it anymore. People like David too much. They like him too little. Saul gets so upset, he throws a spear at David's head, and that is always a good sign you've overstayed your welcome. So David leaves. He goes to the house where he lives with Michael, and then word gets out that Saul is coming to kill him even there. And in verse 11 of the same chapter, it says, Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michael let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michael took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment, and she put some goat's hair at the head. Then Saul sent the men to capture David. Michael said, he is ill. Saul sent the men to, back to see David, and he told them, bring him to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed, and at the head, with some goat's hair. If you're paying attention, this is totally the screenplay to Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But what I want you to notice here is the Saul's anxiety is actually bringing about the very thing he's the most anxious about. Okay, so in my life, I currently have a modest amount of power. In my job and in my home, I have a small dominion where it matters for a little while what I say. Um, and I slept a lot better when I grew up poor. A lot of people who are driven to power are driven to it because of the anxieties and fears. And even if that's not why you're pursuing it, let me promise you, it almost certainly will come with it. Because having any kind of responsibility or power, you know you're in other people's crosshairs. And the reason I'm saying this is, can you see how Saul ruins his own story? His kids don't trust him. Every time he tries to go after David, his kingdom slips further and further away from him. Until finally, he, he's so tired of David getting all the praise and him losing power. He barges in to his daughter's house in a very marriage that he helped set up. And he's so angry, he's going to make sure they kill this guy, even as he sleeps. And when the covers are ripped back, it's finally revealed for what it always had been. What he had been chasing all along. An idol. An idol that promised everything. 
and eventually took it all and gave him nothing. Before you go making this a Bible story, I want you to consider a couple of things. A couple of years ago, I read an article in a conservative magazine called The Weekly Standard. The title of the article caught my eye. It was called The Spiritual Shape of Political Ideas. And the big idea was when we're turning away from God, we're still using the same language and concepts. We're just using them for our pursuits of power now. And the three examples they gave were, we used to talk about original sin, but today we don't talk about sin. What's replaced it in our common vernacular is privilege. We used to say, confess your sins, and now we say, check your privilege. We used to believe in purity for a faith, now we believe in it for a cause or a candidate. And we police our borders really, really tightly for that. We, we make sure that the speech is sanitized just as much as any witch hunt, witch hunt that went before us. Then it said, we used to worry about like the end of the world and Armageddon and, and God you know, bringing the, the age to come around. But now we worry about the end of the world through like North Korea or global warming. And my point in telling you this is not to make a political point at all. It's to say, when we turn away from worshiping God, we don't turn that part of our brain off. We're always turning towards something else. Before you go and make this a Bible story, remember, idols always promise you everything for nothing. And eventually, like the life of King Saul, they take everything and give you nothing. I mean, you know, Saul loses his life. His whole family dies from this. He's going to wind up dead. And Saul's not the only one to do this. David, the, the man after God's own heart, does the exact same thing because of his power. He sees a woman. He thinks she's beautiful. He sleeps with her. Turns out she's married. He's got to get rid of her husband, Uriah. So you know what he does? He does to Uriah what Saul did to him, only better. He sends him out into war. And ultimately, to stay in power... To not lose face, he takes a person's life. This is the shame of thrones. We were give, given dominion and power by God. It was the first gift God gave us. But we want more. We want to be God. And to that end, we'll do almost anything. And if you worship this God, you'll always be anxious. You'll always worry about not getting in power, not keeping your power, about losing your power, not having enough power. And the people around you, they don't feel loved. You know what they feel? They feel like you're kicking in the door and killing their husband. They feel manipulated and controlled. They feel like they're a part of a, a, some chess piece and some master game that you have. And what's worse, and this really is worse, you won't even be able to appreciate the throne you actually have. Andy Crouch, who's preached at this church before, um, was the executive editor for Christianity Today for a long time, and he was a campus minister at Harvard for years. He said that in his time at Harvard, he noticed there were three different kinds of students. The first was the achiever. They're the ones that could probably come to mind first when you think they get up early, they stay up late, working their whole life just to be at Harvard. The second kind he called legacy kids. They're kids that have their last names on buildings at Harvard. Their grandparents went there. They always knew they were going to Harvard. But then there's a third kind of kid. The kind of kid who never thought they were going to go to Harvard. And somebody uh, towards the end of their high school career suggested they you know, put in a, an application. These are the kids that Andy says did the best in life. They won the awards. They got the better results in life. He said these kids were less anxious than the achievers and not as entitled as the legacy kids. And he called this third group of people children of grace. Because they realized what a gift it was for them to be there. And then Andy makes the point, but these students, none of them realized how many lotteries, every single one of them won just to be there, that they're all there by grace. Almost every Harvard student is a firstborn. A lot of them are onlyborns. Almost all of them were born into families that were intact and had means. They, almost every Harvard student won a hundred lotteries. They didn't even know that they were playing. They were all children of grace. It's just that most of them didn't know it. You know the irony of this story? It's that Saul was given a throne by God. He wasn't even looking for it. You know what he was looking for? Donkeys. Saul was walking around looking for his lost donkeys. And then all of a sudden he gets to Samuel, the prophet's house. And Samuel says, look, I know you're looking for your donkeys. I'll tell you where they're at. But listen, God ordained this meeting because God has chosen you to be Israel's first king. Saul never, 
ever saw that coming. The whole thing from the beginning was a gift. If Saul would have just realized all this had been given as a gift from God without promises for how long it was going to last, he could have received it totally differently. So let me tell you how this works in my own life. I was poor growing up. I did not plan on going to college. Nobody in my family really did. I was going to be a construction worker. And the little church that I grew up in took out a loan for me to go to school. And my first week at Harding, I was homeschooled my entire life, not exactly like socially ready. I was like, people are everywhere, you know. <laughs> my first week, my freshman Bible teacher said to me, hey, the president of Harding is starting a, a, a prayer group, and I think you'd be a good fit. And I was like, Really? So I went. I didn't have any idea to pursue those kind of things. I never would have thought. So I was in that for years. And a couple of years later, when the Hills asked, uh, the Hills, a large church of Christ in Fort Worth, called Harding and asked, do you have anybody you'd recommend for an intern? The president recommended me. I had no idea that was happening. I had never even heard about this church. But if I hadn't taken that job, I wouldn't have got to work with uh, Rick actually and, and become his associate and I almost certainly wouldn't be your preacher today and whenever I get anxious I remember that story because I didn't earn this I wouldn't even know about I wouldn't even know how to go about trying to earn something like this it's always been a gift, and it's not mine forever. I'm just a steward of it for a short amount of time, called to use it as wisely as possible and never to worship it. Can you see this in your own story yet? Can you see Adam and Eve in your story? This is not a problem for presidents or rulers. Power worship can be something that you know a low-level bureaucrat can use to be a horrible boss wielding their power over other people. You can be a bully in your neighborhood or in your school just to have power. And the only way to get around this, the only antidote to power, worship, to power worship is true worship. Worship of the living God who gave you some kind of power in the first place. This is why Psalms 8 asks that question that's unanswerable. What are human beings that you're mindful of us? You can't answer that question. Why does God care about us without it leading to worship? Without it revealing all we have is a gift. And remembering who is God and who is not. So would you do yourself this favor? The next time you're in a room and you're the most important voice in the room. The next time you can call a meeting and a lot of people will show up. The next time you're in a room and you're at the end of the table. The next time you're um, you know, driving up to your nice and beautiful house. It's probably more nice and beautiful than you realize. Whenever you get that invitation to go to that thing that only... You know, really fancy people get invitations to. Whenever you get that raise or promotion or degree or you start to chest swell up and think, well, it's about time people started realizing, you know. Whenever that happens, whenever you find yourself the smartest person in the room, the, the wealthiest person in the room, whenever you find yourself in rooms where you're not, where they're, they, they're more people are, are more sophisticated than you, whenever you start to feel down, would you remind yourself of this one thing? You're going to die. And all of this life always has been and always will be a gift. Remember in the moment when you start to look down on other people because they don't have the experiences or the resources or talents that you do? Or when you feel diminished because you're around people and you don't have the things they do? Would you remember in those moments where you know, this idolatry is about to gain another inch in your own heart? Would you remind yourself, you didn't make yourself. Your personality, your talents, they're all gifts. And you had no control over them. You had no control over when you were born, where you were going to be born, or when and where your life will end. We're all children of grace. Because we're all children of God. And so it was curious that in that first century... That in the shadow of temples, giant temples like that to Zeus, people would leave those temples and that worship to come to little house churches that were all gathered around a meal. A meal that was unlike anything that had ever been done before. A meal that was around the idea that God is not like Zeus. 
around the idea that who could be proud because heaven is humble. And in one of those churches, Paul planted a church in Philippi, and there started an argument between two women. And we don't, on one level, know what the argument was, but on another level, we know what it is because it's what it's always been about. I'm not getting my way, those kind of things. And Paul's advice to them was to quote to them a song, one of the early Christian songs in Philippians 2. He says to them, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Hey, hey, remember who we're following? Remember who we're gathered around? Don't do anything out of selfish ambition. In humility, consider others better than yourself. Don't look to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And in our relationships, don't have the same mindset as that of King Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider, like Adam and Eve, equality with God something to be grasped. But instead, he made himself a servant. He humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. And God reversed the script. He exalted the one who was humbled. So that every knee would bow at the name of King Jesus. Because Jesus may be a king. He may be like a king, but kings are not like him. So we gather together like Christians have for 2,000 years, around that table, reminding ourselves of the humility and goodness of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for showing us in our more foolish moments when we're trying to be like you, that this is what you're like. So God, as we break this bread and drink this cup, as we remember who you really are, May it shine light on us. May it shine light on the gifts that you have given us so freely. May we receive this meal today with gratitude. And may it bleed over into great gratitude for every other part of our life. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, desperate for you. Desperate for you, I surrender. I want
The, uh, the prayers of the people, uh, the elders pray over these during the week, and if you want somebody to pray with you right now, just personally, you can head out these doors right here, and go to the right, there's a little prayer room there, and people pray with you.
Uh, what I'm about to say, I've already shared this with my Sunday school class, you know, but I keep thinking about it, and so I decided to go ahead and share it with you today also. But uh, when I was younger, I thought to be a Christian, I kind of had to be a good person, you know, but when I got older, I discovered that all I really needed was a messed up life. And yeah, I'm not saying you have to mess up your life, but I'm just saying when you do have problems, you know, you don't have to have this much together or this much together to talk to God. You know, you can just start right where you are. And that's the God I found in the Bible, and that's the God I found among you here. And um, let's go, let's pray. Lord, we just pray for everybody in the world right now. We pray, that, pray this with this blessing. We say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The, the prayer that stuck out to me this morning was uh, asking for uh, hurricane relief and metaphorical storm relief. And uh, I know we've all got stresses. We've all got wounds. There's a lot of, I think, a lot of pain in some of these requests. Maybe some frustration, maybe angers, maybe just wondering what's going on. And I'm in that place, you know, just from moment to moment. You know, that's, um, that's kind of the way that uh, I think this life happens. But we know that with you, God, we know we have uh, this deposit guarantee in what's to come. We know that this isn't the end. The story's not over. The storyline in the Bible is not over. It's, uh, it's still developing, and we're a part of that storyline. We pray you just be glorified in our lives. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, if you're here and you're a guest and you'd like to know more about joining this church there's a wel or, or becoming a Christian, there's a welcome booth right outside those doors and to the right, and they'd love to help get you connected and answer any questions you might have. Um, remember, this week, ACU Summit, which is a great program. That's every year. A lot of Highland people are presenting on that. Uh, check out one of those brochures. Look it up online, acu.edu slash summit. It's a great event. Hope to see a lot of you there. Let's be standing for a benediction. Until next week, my brothers and sisters, may we come to worship the God of Jesus. May we turn away from our worship of power. And may we come to realize that in the kingdom of God, we are truly safe. Go in peace. It won't be my choice.